Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm very pleased to be invited to be able to address you today uh, on matters concerning general relativity and, and the non-existence of the black hole. It's also a subject, of course, that's fascinated many people, but it really doesn't have any real sound basis in any science, neither in general relativity, general relativity or Newtonian theory. So before I get started on it, uh, I'd just like to go over, make a, a few little comments about these black holes, uh, because there's been, there's been some developments in recent times, like these black holes seem to be reproducing like rabbits. What we get is, let's go quickly through a whole list of things that we have uh, with black holes. We start off with mini, uh, micro black holes, uh, mini black holes, uh, intermediate black holes, what we might call a regular black hole. Then we've got supermassive black holes. Now recently, they've been talking about ultra supermassive black holes. <laughs> and I'm, I'm waiting with bated breath for the next one. Maybe it'll be a mega, ultra, super massive black hole. <laughs> well, the proponents of the black hole seem to just add adjectives and think that that makes it, uh, gives it a more scientific validity. Well, adjectives don't do that. Uh, that's linguistics, it's not science. So uh, I don't think that that's going to help them. Um, the other thing is, of course, we're starting to get lots of reports of photographs on the internet and in journals and so forth and things. And you get things like, See that part you can't see? Yeah, it's a black hole. <laughs> yeah. The other thing is, see all of those shiny things that shine brighter than stars? Yeah, those, oh, yeah, those quasars? Yeah, well, they're black holes too. <laughs> so we now get reports, for example, on quasar 3C279, which is reported as being a black hole. Well, as the previous speaker pointed out, Halton Arp has been speaking about uh, quasar ejections. So what do we got now? Black holes ejecting, black, like being ejected from what? It's black holes are supposed to be sucking up things, digesting matter and, 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 and gobbling up the universe. Of course, then, then we have white holes. They do the opposite. Instead of gobbling up black holes, they vomit, they vomit, they vomit matter back, back into the universe. So, uh, and then we've got wormholes, another whole thing. <laughs> Whatever they are. Anyway, so we see that there's some very dubious ideas here. And what I'd like to do is to give you a number of proofs that uh, black holes are not predicted by general relativity at all. That's the first thing. They're not produced by, general, uh, by Newton's theory, contrary to what is claimed by proponents of the black hole, because it doesn't have the signatures of, of a black hole. And I'll see that, and I'll show you that. And so there are other uh, proofs that I could give, uh, but I've tried to limit myself to those proofs that don't require much in the way of mathematics, because I don't want to bamboozle anybody with the hocus pocus of tensor analysis and differential geometry that Einstein and his followers have been hiding behind for nearly 100 years, confuse everybody, and then say, we can't talk to you people, you don't know how to do sums. So what we'll do is now we'll move on to perhaps the first proof. Now, I'll read it to you, of course. Einstein's field equations couple the gravitational field contained in the curvature of space-time with its sources. I've given there a citation there from a source of this uh, comment. And we can reduce this to some simple, uh, some simple words where we have uh, space-time geometry equals minus kappa times causative matter, that is sources. Well, kappa is nothing other than a coupling constant, so that's no big deal. Space-time geometry and causative matter. Well, we go to the next line and we see this is the mathematical form of it. This is a tensor equation. There's no, nothing frightening about this. People go into a, an apoplectic flit uh, when they see a tensor equation and think, oh, I'm out of my depth. Well, that's not true. When we, when we break this down, you'll see that you will not need to know anything about tensor analysis, no, no, have no need to be able to make a calculation in tensor analysis, and not really know much about, or anything about differential geometry to be able to follow the arguments that I'm now going to present to you. So the words space-time geometry equals kappa times causative matter are reduced to this uh, simple expression, where G sub UV is called the Einstein tensor, and it describes space-time geometry, the curvature of space-time, which Einstein says is the gravitational field. Now, we see that this is a, a, a relationship between the curvature and the causative matter. So space-time and its curvature, the so-called gravitational field, is coupled to its sources. So is a there is a causal link between space-time and material causes. These subscripts here take on the values of 0, 1, 2, 3, they add a little bit of complication to it, but they're not frightening. 
Now, there's some simple terminology that I would like to use because I'll come across, you'll come across this as we go along, is that if we have a tensor T with subscripts, it's just called a covariant tensor. If it's a, if it's a tensor with superscripts, it's called a covariant tensor. And if it's a tensor with superscripts and subscripts, it's called a mixed tensor. There's nothing difficult about that. The final thing that we have is the order of a tensor is equal to the number of suffixes. Well, when we look at the equations up here, we see that Einstein's field equations are second order tensors because they're two subscripts, U and V. That's it. Okay. Now, we come to now Einstein's so-called field equations from which the black hole is derived. And Einstein says that if uh, T sub UV equals zero, his uh, G sub UV reduces to R sub UV for empty space outside a body. And R sub UV is called the Ricci tensor. So I've written it as Rick, which is not that often used, but uh, is sometimes used in the literature. So Rick equals zero is supposedly a set of field equations that describe the gravitational field outside a body. Well, so we ask now, what then is the source of the gravitational field outside a body? Bearing in mind that he's already removed all the sources by setting the energy momentum tensor to naught. So he's taken out all the, all the matter that causes the gravitational field with one hand, and then he uses the words outside a body to re-put in, or to put back in, the very notion that there's a source present. So this is a bit of linguistic mumbo jumbo. What you've got now is no matter uh, but an object present. It's a contradiction. In fact, if we ask Einstein what's the relation to Hilbert's solution for Rick equals zero, he says M denotes the source or M denotes the sun's mass centrally symmetrically placed ab about the origin of coordinates. So the introduction of mass here is done by of some sort of surreptitious linguistic method. We've taken it out and put it in with another idea. It's a circular argument. And so this idea that uh, Rick equals zero actually is quite meaningless. Now, as I said here, it's a subtle play on the words outside a body. Well, so it's meaningless. It contains no matter because that's what the meaning of the energy momentum tensor is. That's the matter part. Well, if it's gone, you've got no matter. So what have we got here? A set of equations that describes a totally empty universe. Well, that doesn't describe anything. You look into the sky and what do you see? It's not empty. Now, there's one other point I'd like to make, as you see on the bottom here, is that the black hole was obtained from a, a Hilbert solution. David Hilbert was a German mathematician and he was working contemporaneously with Einstein and uh, he came up uh, with the field equations, same as Einstein, evidently shortly before Einstein, but that is not commonly known. But it is not Schwarzschild solution, even though it goes by Schwarzschild solution, the so-called solution to this set of field equations. All you have to do is look up Schwarzschild's original paper, which I've done, and you find that the solutions are very different. Schwarzschild's solution doesn't allow a black hole. Hilbert's solution, which was a corruption of, of Schwarzschild's solution, is misinterpreted and allows a black hole, supposedly. We'll see how or why. Okay, so we see from the first proof that We've got a circular argument where there's allegedly matter, but then there's actually no matter. So this doesn't describe anything. So in other words, when you set the energy momentum tensor to zero, Einstein's tensor can't reduce to Rick equals naught. So the whole idea of that is fallacious. And the solution to that, of course, means it's fallacious as well. And that's Hilbert's solution, Schwarzschild's solution, and any other solutions, they're all the equivalent solutions to these. That's a pretty simple proof that the, the whole idea is uh, very dubious. Now, if we come to the second proof, Einstein asserted that his principle of equivalence and his laws of special relativity must hold in sufficiently small, finite regions of his gravitational field, and that these regions can be located anywhere in his gravitational field. Now, I'll point out that both the principle of equivalence and the laws of special relativity are actually defined in terms of the a priori presence of multiple, arbitrarily large, finite masses and photons. All right? And do we see here a quote uh, from the Dictionary of Geophysics, Astrophysics and Astronomy. Black holes were first discovered as purely mathematical solutions of Einstein's field equations. This solution, the Schwarzschild black hole, is a nonlinear solution of the Einstein equations of general relativity. 
It contains no matter. Yeah, well, we already established that. And exists forever in an asymptotically flat space-time. So, since it's empty, there can't be a black hole. Now, there's another point here. This a black hole, and all black hole solutions, pertain to a universe that allegedly contains only one mass. So, the universe contains a lot more than one mass. And what you mean by a gravitational field to a universe that contains only one mass? First, it doesn't model anything real realistically. And how do you detect the, the gravitational field if you don't put in some other masses? Well, we've only got a one mass body here, a one mass universe. So, uh, you can't get a black hole. Doesn't make any sense. Now, the principle of superposition doesn't apply in, in uh, general relativity because Einstein's field equations are highly nonlinear. Now, mathematically, this is a very simple expression. If you have a solution x and y, two separate solutions, then the linear combination, ax plus by, is not a solution. All right? That's what the uh, principle of superposition means mathematically. Well, when we talk about it physically, this simply means that one cannot pile up matter into any given space-time solution to obtain additional matters, charges, photons, and electromagnetic fields, etc., as desired. So, in other words, you've got a black hole solution. It contains one mass in the whole universe. You cannot then just arbitrarily say, oh, what I'll do is I think I'll put in another black hole and another black hole so that all these black holes mutually exist and mutually interact in a mutual space-time that by mathematical construction contains no matter. How does that work? Well, they do, the, well, the proponents of the black hole actually just do that by a false analogy with Newton's theory. Because in Newton's theory, there is no relationship between matter and space. There is no causal connection between them. And the principle of superposition applies. And that's why in Newton's theorem, or Newton's theory, we can have as many masses as you like. Now, if you want to work out the interaction of three bodies ro uh, uh, revolving around each body uh, center of gravity, it becomes very complicated. And beyond that, we can't solve them because the equations become too difficult. But there's no conceptual reason why you can't stick in all sorts of matter, photons, lots of stars, and the rest of it. But in Einstein's theory, you cannot. This means that every single configuration of matter that you propose for a solution to Einstein's field equations must be described by an appropriate energy momentum tensor, and the field equations solved separately for that particular configuration. That's never been done. Why? Because there are no known solutions to Einstein's field equations for two or more masses, and there's no existence theorem by which you can even assert that his field equations contain latent solutions for such configurations of matter. So all solutions to Einstein's field equations uh, pertain to only one of two things, a universe that contains nothing, or a universe that contains one mass, whether it be cosmological or otherwise. That models nothing in reality, and it has really no meaning. Because we know from experiments that uh, gravitation is an interaction between two bodies. And um, this is, for example, in the experiments of Cavendish. You take two cylinders, or two, not cylinders, two uh, spheres, they're equal bodies, they're suspended, they're fixed, and then you release them. They'll approach one another. Okay? You take one, well, what else have you got? You know, there's nothing to do with it. It just sits there. Okay, so again we can say that Rick equals zero is a space-time that by mathematical construction contains no matter, and owing to the principle of equivalence, you can't stick in more, so the black hole can't possibly exist because it's a one-body solution, right? I'll come to some other uh, issues shortly and show you that y that doesn't even make sense. So a few more comments on this proof three. As I said, there are no known solutions to his field equations for two or more masses. No existence theorem by which it can be even asserted that his field equations contain latent solutions for this such configurations. So all talks of multiple black holes is quite meaningless. But what do we get told? Mr. Hawking tells us for existence, oh, black holes are merging. Black holes are in binary systems. Black holes collide. Where did he get all these extra black holes? He just stuck them in. You can't do that. It's, it's impossible in, in, in Einstein's theory because it's a nonlinear system. Just like in nonlinear uh, systems of differential equations, you can have solutions 
two different solutions to a linear differential equation, add them together and that creates another solution. If you have two separate solutions to nonlinear differential equations, you add them together, you don't get a solution to that nonlinear equation. That's it. Okay. So as I've remarked before, I'll just reiterate that all black hole solutions pertain to a universe that allegedly contains only one mass. And so they are inv in totally invalid models. Proof 4 is a little bit of mathematics here. Don't be frightened of it. Uh, it looks complicated, but when we break it down, it really becomes pretty simple. Now, this is Hilbert's solution, and usually they write C and G equal to unity. And so you get a simplified expression, but that hides everything. It's a bit slick, but so, so I've written it here uh, with C and G explicitly, so nothing can be hidden. And you'll see why I've done that, and how black hole escape velocities are uh, allegedly obtained, how radii of so-called event horizons are obtained, and, and we'll see that that's really another fudge. Because there are things called the components of the metric tensor. We can easily read them off. We don't have to really know greatly what we mean by a metric tensor. Uh, but first I'll say what we mean by a metric. Well, they're either called, called line elements or metrics. This is nothing other than a fancy name for a distance formula. And we all learned in high school how to cal dis calculate the distance between two points with coordinates x1, y1 and x x2, y2 in the Euclidean plane. So you get delta s squared is equal to delta x squared plus delta y squared. You can extend that to three dimensions and add a delta z squared. It's a distance formula. And in that case, all the signs of the components are positive. Notice in this one, it's very, very strange because the time part, which has got the dt squared there, is positive, and all the other parts are negative. So we call it a pseudo-Riemannian metric space because it relates to Riemannian geometry, and because of its differences in signs, it's called pseudo-Riemannian. Just complicated names for some complicated mathematical ideas. So what we really want to know is components of the metric tensor for this expression. Well, we can read them off. It's really easy. And uh, we'll give the names for the metric tensor G with sub two subscripts on them because we're dealing with second order tensors. So G naught naught is 1 minus 2 GM over C squared R. G11 minus 1 over 1 minus 2 GM over C squared R. G T2 minus R squared. And G33 minus R squared sine squared theta. What you see is that these are nothing other than the coefficients of the differential elements that appear in the first expression. Okay, now, before I go on to do an analysis of these two g naught noughts and, and g one ones, first we want to identify what R is. This becomes quite hilarious. Here's what the, this is what the proponents of uh, the black hole tell us. The quantity R has been variously and vaguely called a distance, the radius, the radius of a two-sphere, the coordinate radius, the radial coordinate, the Schwarzschild R coordinate, the radial space coordinate, the aerial radius, the reduced circumference, the shorter distance a light ray travels to the centre, and finally, a gauge choice. It defines the coordinate R. Now, in the particular case of R equals 2gm over c squared, it is invariably called the Schwarzschild radius, or the gravitational radius namely for the radius of the event horizon of the black hole. Well, there's a lot of definitions here. Which one do you want to pick? <laughs> you know? Well, they're all wrong. <laughs> it's easy to prove. Then to uh, reiterate a little bit further on this, in his paper on a stationary system with spherical symmetric, uh, symmetry consisting of many gravitating bodies, Einstein himself continually and incorrectly refers to R as a radius. You can easily verify that by looking at the paper. You can download it from the internet. So with all these definitions, what do you conclude? I conclude that there's utter confusion. That Einstein and his followers just don't know what R is. That's the truth of it. With, those, with all those definitions, the, as I said, it's just an arbitrary choice. But this is a geometric relation. And so we must have a definite geometric relation for all the components in this expression. Okay, so 
The correct identification of R completely invalidates the black hole once again. Well, you'll never see it in the literature because I think I'm the only one that ever made the calculation. So let's consider the identity of R just for, just for the fun of this. Now, as we saw in the previous expression here for the metric, there was a time part and a spatial part. Well, I've taken out the spatial part. It's got all positive signs because you saw that there was the time part minus all the spatial bit. Well, so the spatial bit is just all of this. It's all positive signs. Now, if we take the surface in this spatial section, that's the last bit on the end here. R squared, d theta squared plus sine squared theta, d phi squared. There are only two variables here. The things that are variable are theta and phi. They're angular quantities. R doesn't change. You know, it can, can change later when we're looking at the, uh, the, whole me uh, the later metric, but we're going to consider this surface. Now, there is a thing called Gaussian curvature. Gaussian curvature is a property of a surface, and it's an intrinsic property of a surface. Carl Gauss proved this long ago, and that's why it's named after him. Now, it's independent of any embedding space. What do I mean? If you take this surface and you, in, and you embed it in ordinary Euclidean 3 space, for example, right? that doesn't change the nature of the intrinsic geometry of the surface. So we can consider the intrinsic geometry of the surface without any consideration of any embedding space, whether it be Euclidean 3 space or the very complicated looking four-dimensional pseudo-Romanian space-time metric that uh, is proposed by Einstein and his followers. So how do we calculate the uh, Gaussian curvature of a surface? Well, it's really easy. Any differential geometry book will tell you if the Gaussian curvature is k, it's equal to r sub 1, 2, 1, 2 over g. Well, when we look at r sub 1, 2, 1, 2, well, we recognize that as a tensor. What order is it? Well, we count them up. There's one, two, three, four. There's four subscripts. So it's a fourth order tensor. And in this case, it's just written as a covariant tensor. Four order tensor. Okay, and what's G? It's the determinant of the metric tensor. In the previous slide, we saw the components of the metric tensor, which we just read off and wrote down. And so we find the determinant of that. In this particular case, there is only two because we've got r squared and sine squared theta. They're the only two coefficients of the differential elements. So this is a much simpler calculation. Although, if you do it by hand, it's a bit tedious, takes a lot of paper, sharp pencil, and a bottle of aspirin. <laughs> I know, I've done it. <laughs> <laughs>